When it comes to electric vehicles, Mercedes-Benz seem to be, well, kind of covering all their bases. And they've been very adept at doing so. Now, some of their cars they've just electrified, such as the little GLA crossover and the, the, the GLB, sort of like a little SUV. And of course, they're called the EQA and the EQB. And of course, not forgetting the really brilliant EQV people carrier. But then they also give us standalone EV models, such as the EQE and the EQS, which are not electrified E-classes and S-classes. They sit on a bespoke platform and sit alongside the combustion engine compatriots, which kind of gives them a little bit of a problem when it comes to a naming strategy. You see, if Mercedes-Benz decided to offer a smaller saloon car in electric form, what would they call it? Because you've already got an EQC, which is an SUV. And of course, you can't electrify an A-Class and call it an EQA because you've already got that in a small crossover. So what do they do, especially when it comes to adding new models into the mix? Such as this one, because this is the SUV version of the EQS. So what have they called it? Well, simple, an EQS SUV. Welcome to this week's Road Test Review, welcome to the new Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV and as always, welcome to Auto EV. Now, before we go on to this week's Road Test Review of the new Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV, it is of course that time where I ask you to make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. And once you've done that, make sure you've pressed the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. Once you watch the video, if you do enjoy it, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And remember, don't forget, leave us your comments down below as well. Let me know your thoughts on the cars that we review, such as the new Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV, and of course, on the Auto EV channel as a whole. Now, given the upward push, of SUVs, luxury SUVs, it kind of was inevitable that Mercedes-Benz were going to get in on the act. I mean, of course, we've already seen such established players such as BMW and Audi give us sort of like, um, six-figure price tags on their um, electric SUV offerings such as the iX and, of course, the EQ8 e-tron. But here's the thing, Mercedes-Benz already offer two six-figure luxurious SUVs and, confusingly, they're also got a weird kind of naming strategy going on because there's the GLS and then the G-Class. Now the G-Class of course is like the old G-Wagon and it's kind of it's kind of a bit more upright and a bit more kind of beloved of you know, people should always say who like a little bit of rap music and prefer things a little bit kind of murdered out. Whereas the GLS is their kind of Range Rover type of offering almost. But here's the thing they could quite easily have just electrified the GLS because they've done it before with the other models in the range such as, well, the EQC and, as I say, the EQA and, of course, the EQB and they've been very successful at doing so. But as we know, that still carries some compromises. Whereas if you build on a bespoke platform, you can do away with those compromises. So what else were they to do? But take the EQS Saloon's EV platform and build an SUV on it. And here it is. But do we really need another one? I mean, is Mercedes-Benz really kind of just throwing too much behind these ultra-luxury electric SUVs? Because remember, we're also going to see at some point, <laughs> and if you haven't had enough letters so far, an EQG, in other words, an electric version of the G-Class. So where does this fit in? And is it really necessary? But before we get started on this week's road test review, let's take a quick snapshot at what the EQS SUV is all about. Well, of course, as its name suggests, it is based on the EQS luxury saloon platform, but of course here in luxurious SUV form. The car has a 108.4 kilowatt hour battery, giving a WLTP range of up to 365 miles. There will be a choice of two power outputs in the car, both with dual motor, so all-wheel drive, and they go from either the 360 brake horsepower model or the 544 brake horsepower EQS 580. Its price is going to start between £129,000 and go all the way up to in excess of £250,000 when the Maybach version hits the streets. 
And of course, it's designed to compete with such cars such as BMW's range-topping iX and of course Audi's Q8 e-tron in its top-of-the-range guises. However, given the number of large luxury SUVs that are currently on the market and yet to appear in the market, do we really need another one? Or am I being a little bit hard on Mercedes-Benz here? Because obviously they wouldn't build the car if there wasn't demand for it. Well, of course, the only way that we're going to answer that is by putting it through the full road test that actual car bars are trusting when it comes to choosing their next electric vehicle. And that is the Auto EV one. All right, we're going to start with styling as always. And what have we got? Well, we've got another Mercedes-Benz EQ, haven't we really? It's that kind of smoothed over front end that we saw on the EQS and the EQE with a real focus on aerodynamics to aid efficiency. And there's a lot of little bits around the car where they've really kind of paid attention to aerodynamics, which I'll show you as we go around. But it does result in a slightly anonymous looking car in some respects, especially in this white um, that I've got here, this press car, which is not ideal. However, never mind. Um, you've got this big swathe of plastic at the front, obviously, in place of a grill, but you've got your nice, this kind of the constellation of little three-pointed stars that surround the big centrally mounted three-pointed star, which is quite nice. It kind of breaks it up a little bit and gives you something to look at. These headlights, these are Mercedes-Benz digital LED headlights, and they are phenomenally good. I had them, um, I was driving the EQE and the EQS that I had on test at night time, and I have to say they are phenomenal. A really good safety feature um, from Mercedes. The, the amount of light you get from these is incredible. They've got some kind of ridiculous amount of hundreds of thousands of pixels in each lamp, and it works amazingly well. And when you start it up, you get this kind of little animated dance as well, which is a bit gimmicky, but in terms of usability, the lights are fantastic, so I certainly won't knock it. They're joined by this, obviously, this light bar that stretches across the front here. But yeah, it's just, again, it's that kind of typical, kind of slightly anonymous look that Mercedes-Benz are going for. Now, they could have been controversial, like BMW, and gone for something a bit wild and wacky. But of course, then that can turn people off as well. Mercedes-Benz customers tend to be a little bit more, shall we say, reserved and play it safe. So I can't really knock them for that but it's not what you'd call a great looking car. It's not a design classic, is it? Anyway, there we go. Um, cooling's down at the bottom here, as you'd expect. Um, and obviously you've got the embedded camera in there as well. The, whilst there's a bit of fakery plastic here, these are the kind of air curtains that kind of take the airflow around and then shoot it around the wheels at the side. So whilst there is that bit, fake bit of plastic there, the rest of it is actually there for a purpose. But yeah, it's a little bit anonymous looking from the, one, from the front, as I say, not helped by this white paint finish. But you kind of know what you're getting with it, don't you? Now, as you move around the side, you kind of see, well, again, typical kind of Mercedes-Benz kind of anonymity and reservedness. Um, there's going to be two trim levels in the UK to start off with. I'll talk about them when we get onto the pricing section. But both of them get these 21, or they get 21 inch wheels as standard. There's nothing bigger than that, thankfully, at the moment. Um, I'm sure that obviously there will as more models become available. As I alluded to, there's going to be a Maybach edition as well. And I'm sure, of course, there's going to bound to be AMG models, as you'd expect. But for the now, 21 inch wheels is enough but there's no real kind of big chunky kind of SUV clues now another little um, caveat here this is not a full UK spec car Mercedes-Benz UK haven't managed to get a full kind of proper UK spec car on the press fleet as yet so there's a couple of things missing off it which I'll talk about a little bit later but one of them is um, the side sills uh, side steps sorry they're going to have side steps um, on the UK cars as well which are designed to help the air flow around the side again going for that kind of aerodynamic efficiency that Mercedes-Benz are looking at. Um, the door handles are worth talking about. Not often I say that about a door handle, but of course they're the pop-out ones that we've seen on the um, other EQ models as well. And of course Jaguar do them on the I-Pace. But they're illuminated at night, so when they pop out you can see where you're not grabbing around in the dark, as well as they have the little puddle lamp as well, so you can see where you're stepping into. But other than that, it's, as I say, a fairly kind of anonymous and reserved shape as you get round the side of it. It is quite a big car, that's what I will say, because obviously it's designed to be the top-of-the-range SUV, as far as Mercedes-Benz are concerned. And the UK cars will have seven seats as standard. This is a five-seat car that's come from Germany, but the UK cars will all get seven seats as standard, so that's the reason why it is quite a lengthy car. And, of course, as you move around the rear, well, again, same story, nothing really sort of like to frighten you off here, is there? 
again. There we go, full width light bar. It's very, very similar in sort of design to sort of the light bar that you get on the, the EQC, the smaller um, SUV. Now, there's going to be one in between those two as well. Of course, it's going to be called the EQE SUV, um, which is going to be based on the EQE saloon as well. So I can imagine that pretty much what you're looking at is an EQE SUV, but enlarged slightly. So you won't be shocked when we see that one when we do a road test on that. But it's okay. I mean, I say there's nothing that's going to really scare you off here, but there's nothing really to get you excited about either. There's no real sort of like quirky little bits of design or some nice little touches and such. You get this kind of big roof spoiler here, which obviously has got the sides that come down here again to aid the airflow around the back of the car. And as you go down to the bottom here, you've got the kind of weird kind of little slats here that are almost kind of chromed plastic to make you think of them as maybe as exhaust. I don't know, that's what I thought when I saw it. But this diffuser area here, again, designed to take the airflow from underneath the car and just channel it out the back. Big EQS 450 badge there. Of course, your three-pointed star, which doubles as the boot lid release, and of course, the reversing camera when that operates, um, and a rear wiper on the back. That's it. So, in terms of its design, it's familiar Mercedes. It's nothing that's going to say it's going to scare you away from it. But have they done enough? Should they have really maybe taken a slightly more risque kind of path when you look at things like the BMW iX? And of course, you've got the big stature of the things like Range Rover, which again, price-wise, this car is going to compete with. And of course, the handsome new Audi Q8 e-tron. Have they done enough? Or have they just played a little bit too safe? As always, let us know your comments down below. Okay. Practicality wise, what are you looking at? Well, as I say, bear in mind that this car is just a five seat version. As I say, we're going to get seven seat versions in the UK, but the rear seats are quite usable. But if you don't have them in place, then what you have is a boot space of 565 litres. So the, the, the third row of seats folded down, it will be like this, and that's 565 litres of usable space, which is pretty decent in fairness, and it is a good size, um, a good size of boot, and it's nicely shaped. It's bigger than the BMW iX, because you remember, that's only about 500 litres, and it's got this tailgate that, you know, as I say, it kind of really intrudes into your headspace. So Mercedes-Benz have got a bit more practicality going on here. Um, you've got some underfloor storage here for some bits and bobs, which I'm sure you probably could fit these kind of cable bags into, but they seem to just be lying loose. Um, but even so, as I say, you've still got a relatively amount of sort of like practicality there. You've got the folding sort of like rear seat bits there, because if you fold the rear seats down, that takes you up to a gargantuan 2,020 litres of usable boot space with all the seats folded down. So that's pretty decent. Um, You've got the usual kind of thing, you've got the little hooks on the side there, and you've got some nice kind of chrome kind of tie down bits there, and some little nets on the side there. But again, nothing sort of like really to sort of like scare you away. But as I say, in terms of its usable space, I think that's pretty decent. Yet, despite that space up the back, and despite being on a dedicated EV platform, as usual, you can't open the front, there's no usable luggage space up at the front, which again. I feel there's a little bit of a wasted opportunity, Mercedes-Benz. Must try harder. Now, rear space is excellent, as you'd expect for a car of this size. And as I say, the UK cars will be seven-seater as a standard, which I'll show you with a little bit of B-roll now. But getting in and out of the second row, in terms of what the car I have here, what's well, nice and easy, because actually, although it's an SUV, it's not that much of a climb up, in fairness. You just kind of step across and then shut the door. Now, it's very nice back here because there's acres of space, as you would expect. Um, and of course, three across is not going to be a problem at all because of the width of the car. And as I say, because it's a bespoke EV, it's a completely flat floor. So there is plenty of foot space for a middle passenger. However, obviously, if it's just the two that you're carrying in the back, then obviously there's certainly enough lounging space for them, which is absolutely fine. Now, but depending on the specification that you go for as to how the back looks, this is the premium plus car. In other words, this is sort of like the lead-in to the range. It's not the, sort of like the, the model up. So you don't get the, sort of the rear entertainment or, or anything fancy like that in it. So if I'm being honest with you, a car at this price level, it's a little bit disappointing in some of the specs back here because it... Well, there's just really nothing to do other than just sit here. But as I say, there's plenty of space. You've got these nice kind of 
head restraint kind of pillows, which are quite decent. There is um, electrically reclining rear seats as well, so you can have that. And of course, they are heated as well, which obviously, as you'd expect. Storage is fairly decent. You've got your mat pockets there, which are the kind of airline style, the kind of rigid ones. The door bins are okay. They're shaped for a water bottle, which if you'll allow me to grab, I'll let you have a look at. You can get those down in there quite easily. And then of course you've got your fold out ones there as well, which will take the two water bottles as well. So, decent amount of space, decent amount of storage. Headroom's good as well. Again, because the car is the seven seat, the roof line goes all the way back. And even with this big glass panoramic roof that's in it, I've got absolutely acres of space here. And I think even if you're six foot tall, there, no one's gonna feel short changes in the back of an EQS SUV at all. Rear climate control system, um, which is obviously there. And if you flip down the little part there, you've got two USB-C sockets. But as I say, if you want any more toys, you need to spend a little bit more money. Now this EQS SUV is the business edition. So this has got the rear entertainment package, as you can see. Where your rear accommodation, your rear passengers have the twin screens in front of you. And also this fold down armrest also comes with this flip up tablet as well. So as well as being able to sort of like, a, he says, control various different sort of like things from here, you can use this tablet to control things like the radio and the infotainment system as well, which is really quite nice. It feels a bit more special than the AMG line Premium Plus, and it certainly feels more in line with a car of this price bracket. Okay, so inside is familiar Mercedes-Benz, just like the outside. Now, this is the lead-in model to the range, so this is what they call the AMG Line Premium Plus. Um, and it's the only trim level where you don't get the magnificent hyperscreen as standard. So if you go up to the, the business edition, I think they call it, the next model up, then you'll get the hyperscreen as standard. So if it's the AMG Line Premium Plus you get, you don't get it as standard, but you can have it as an option. Instead of which, obviously, you get the familiar two screen displays that we saw when we had the EQE model, which is quite nice. And I must admit, I love the hyper screen. I think it works really, really well. And it's not as distracting as you think, um, because obviously, if you don't have a, a passenger with you, the third screen, which is in front of them, doesn't operate. So in other words, what you're left with is pretty much what you have here anyway. Um, so it's not too bad. And I don't mind this kind of split kind of screen here with the, the one in front of the driver and then obviously the big central infotainment set, uh, system because you do get some physical buttons along it as well, which isn't so bad. So it doesn't feel quite as kind of, dare to suggest, basic as you might think without it. Um, okay, so where do we start? Well, okay, let's start with the driving position because the driving position is pretty decent. You've got a good range of adjustment on these seats, um, which are also controlled by these more kind of touch sensitive um, seat controls that are on the door. And they've got a good range of adjustment on them. They're ventilated and heated, as you'd expect at this kind of price point. And obviously, your head restraints move electronically as well. And you do tend to get, let me just move that out there, a good driving position, no matter your kind of shape or size. So that's the one thing. Obviously, you've got a, an electronically controlled steering column, and this is the particular one, this AMG Line Premium Plus, has that sort of three-spoke, very kind of sporty design. However, a little bit like the EQE I found, when I've got it in my position, it's cutting out the quadrants of the two dials where I want to see. So in other words, the speedometer on the left and the power reading on the right, but of course, like the other car, you can configure them as you can with all these kind of modern day screens. So it's not too bad, actually. Let me just, oh, that's the one for that side. If I do this side here, so I can scroll across and change it as to how I want the screen to look. So I can have the understated look, the sport look, the classic, or I can put my navigation up there. So I can get the map there and I get the central speed there. So all isn't lost. You still get a good range of information displayed at the bottom. So your state of charge, it gives you two readouts on your mileage, uh, your range, sorry, I should say. So what it thinks you're probably capable of doing given what's left in the battery and also what you could potentially get out of it if you change your driving style. So I quite like that, that's quite nice. Um, moving back from that, obviously you've then got the controls on the steering wheel. Now these are touch sensitive 
They're much better than Volkswagens because they sit further in, so you don't tend to hit them with your heel of your hand. You'd have to be driving like that to do that, in fairness. And they've got pretty good response, so as soon as you touch them, and there's a little bit of feedback from some of them, whereas the others, as you scroll, you just get a little click as they move. And they don't tend to zoom along, they click from each one to each one, so I quite like that. It is quite nice. Um, cruise control over on here, you've got your volume of your radio on this one here or down there and then obviously you've got your telephone and then you've got ability to use the touch screen from the steering wheel in this so if you want to go home you just do that and then you can scroll down to your apps that you want so yeah so it's pretty good to use i have to admit if you do want to use the screen it's nice and simple and it's very quick and very responsive to use your climate menu is always on at the bottom, so you just press it and it brings it up there. Um, but as I say, if you just want to adjust temperature, they're always there. And I see you get that nice kind of click to know that you've actually done it. But you can go into a, a further menu if you want to adjust, um, you know, airflow distribution, um, airflow into the second row of seats, the air quality, or your pre-entry kind of climate control system. So you can set it up to get the system um, working before you, you depart in the morning. So you want the car to heat up or cool down, you can set a time in there. All very, very quick and easy. Um, I'm not going to go too much into this because I say we've covered a lot of this before anyway, so there's no point. But what I will say is you do get a very good navigation system, very responsive, very easy to use, exactly as you would expect to find from a company like Mercedes-Benz. Obviously, you've got things like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as well, so you can just hung, uh, hook up your smartphones and use, um, use the functionality from them as well if you want. Um, along the bottom here, you've got your driving uh, dynamic button here, so again, depending obviously on what you want, so eco, um, comfort, sport, um, individual, where you can set everything else up yourself. And there's also an off-road mode as well. So you can set up an off-road um, functionality as well on if you are kind of taking the car off the beaten path. So that's another addition you've got on the SUV models. Um, you've obviously got your all-round uh, parking camera, which is spooky and a bit of witchcraft, which I think is incredible how cars do that these days. But there you go, you can actually see around your car if you use that. Um, and then obviously you've got further things you can change the functionality of so your head up display which is really good which comes up in front of you here um, you can change that how that um, works you can change things like the active lane keep assist the active steering um, and all your other settings they're all in there um, hazard warnings fingerprint recognition turning the screen off and a volume control there with some really bad music on it storage storage is excellent so you've got these little flippy out cup holders which you just touch the bottom of and they will wrap around your, your bottle wire, wireless charging pad in there or you can cover the whole thing up as well two usb ports down in there um nice big central armrest with this connectivity again for your uh, uh, for your mobiles you've got usb sockets there you've got usb c sockets in there and then you've got this massive big under console area here where you've got enough space to drop in, you know, like a handbag or a, a, a satchel or whatever you're carrying around with you, um, or your iPad or whatever, and all that goes down in there. Big panoramic glass sunroof, which again, just the swipe of your finger will have the, the blinds opening and closing, which is rather nice. And again, with regards to the actual build of the interior, it's good. Again, you know, the materials that they use on the top, this kind of leatherette here, this kind of open kind of pour kind of wood that is here, this kind of Alcantara finish here. The only thing I will say, a couple of things about it. First thing is, this is obviously not proper leather on these seats. It's obviously a man-made leather. And it does feel it. It does feel man-made. It's not as good as some manufacturers do. Um, and I'd quite like Mercedes maybe to adopt BMW's kind of approach where they can offer you different materials, you know, like a kind of cashmere or a wool. This is a luxury SUV. There should be a little bit more choice in it. But for the basic model, this does feel a little bit, well, a bit 1980s, sort of like W124 taxi at a Berlin airport for me. I'd just like that to feel a bit plusher. The only other thing, again, is my usual gripe. Whilst I love the style of these air vents, they're just too plasticky. They, ha they have no place 
and a £120,000 luxury SUV as far as I'm concerned. But other than that, in terms of its usability, its functionality, and its driving position and comfort, it's pretty much as you'd expect. Now the battery on the EQS SUV is a gargantuan 108.4 kilowatt hours, um, which should give, according to WLTP figures, a range of up to 365 miles. And I've always found Mercedes-Benz cars to be relatively efficient. Bear in mind, this is a big old car and it's a real heavy old thing. But that aero efficiency with the styling really does pay off and it does help it achieve a relatively decent efficiency. Now, charging speeds, well, they're good at 200 uh, kilowatts, if not revolutionary. And there's no kind of vehicle to load and no 800 volt architecture here, which again, other manufacturers do offer. So that's a little bit of a, a little bit of a shame. Now, obviously, if you can find a charger capable of delivering the 200 kilowatts, um, such as the Ionity ones, for instance, then you can go from your usual benchmark of 10 to 80 percent in just over half an hour. However, bear in mind that the size of this battery, if you've got a seven kilowatt wall box at home and you come up and you've got absolutely zero miles left in it and you put it on charge, it's gonna take nearly 17 hours to top this Leviathan up to 100%. Now, as I say, there's two powertrains available um, with the EQS SUV, both obviously dual motor, four wheel drive, all wheel drive. Um, so you have the choice of this, which is the EQS 450, um, and that will give you 360 brake horsepower. And that will give you a not to 60 time around about the six seconds mark, which is plenty fast enough, let's be honest, for a big SUV that's only a couple of hundred kilos shy of three tons. But if you do want more, then obviously you can jump up to the EQS 580 and that will take the power up to 544 brake horsepower. And that will bring down the not to 60 time to or just over four seconds. Now you're hearing a little beep there, and that's because this is this car set up as I say as a German spec car, and it's, it's telling me I'm going over the speed limit at 70 mile, 70 kilometres an hour, but I'm in a 50 mile an hour zone. So apologies for the interruption there. If you want more power than even the EQS 580, then as I say, the recently shown EQS My Back Edition. Well, that's over 649 brake horsepower. And of course, I am sure there is going to be a plethora of AMG models around very, very soon as well. But at the moment, we're dealing with the lead-in car, which is this, the, the, the EQS 450. How does it feel? Well, it's fine. As I say, I don't have an issue with this car at all in the way it drives. Um, it, it performs perfectly adequately as you would want, sort of like, you know, from a big, Sort of like you know, sort of like, as I say, nearly three ton Leviathan of an SUV. I mean, it's picks up its skirts and goes along quite happily. I don't see a massive problem with it, to be honest with you. But it does feel its weight. That's the one thing that I will say about it. The car does feel its weight. You can't disguise that weight in this car. So if you're thinking that you want to get one of these and start tearing round sort of like the roundabouts of Milton Keynes, where I'm up test driving the car today, then I maybe choose something else because you see you can't really disguise the weight of this car. Now you can change um, obviously the driving modes as I said earlier and as I alluded to. So you've got um, eco, comfort, sport and individual. You can't, it says you can't use sport with a roof load. So if you've got a roof box on the top obviously you won't be able to use that. So let's try it in sport mode and let's see how that feels with it as well. Um, while I'm waiting on the lights change, what can I tell you? Well, I say the driving position is very, very good. It's very nice, very comfortable. You've got a good range of adjustment on the seat. Um, I haven't quite got it set up perfectly for me, but it's not bad. Um, I like the fact you can adjust um, the, um, the driver's display, as I say, because I just feel that steering wheel just cuts out those two to top quadrants of that dial, which is a little bit irritating um, for me, if I'm being honest with you. But, you know, as I say, you can change it, so it's not the end of the world. Uh, what else is to say? Well, we're in sport mode now, so yeah, so it does feel like it's picking its skirts up, but yeah, you pitch it into a bend, and you do feel the weight of the car there, you know, as you kind of come round that corner, you do feel the weight of it. It just feels like it's, there's a lot of mass here, despite the fact you've got the batteries well low in the car. You can't disguise the fact that it's got a slightly higher centre of gravity than, say, an EQS saloon or obviously an EQE saloon. Um, 
the brakes. Now, I want to talk about the brakes a little bit because I've not been that impressed with them. Now, I maybe spend, need to spend a little bit longer with the car to give a full whether or not it's just my thinking, but it doesn't feel like they're actually that confidence inspiring. Now you can um, you can adjust the, the brake regen um, through the paddles behind the steering wheel. Um, so you've got strong recuperation, uh, normal or off completely. So if you're on the motorway, you take it off and the car will just coast along. Now that's good for efficiency. That's what you want on a motorway. And then if you come into town, you know, so that you can ramp it up to normal or strong. I'm coming to some traffic lights here and I'm not even touching the brake pedal and the car is slowing down to a halt on the strong recuperation. So you do have effectively one pedal driving with it and that is really very good. I do like that. You have a further mode, so if you pull on, uh, so you pull the, the left paddle and hold it back, then it goes into intelligent recuperation. Now we've seen this on other cars before, so obviously it judges where the car is. So it'll use the GPS locator, so if you're coming up to a roundabout, for instance, it'll slow the car down. Or if the car in front, we've got a big truck in front of it at the moment, if it slows down and I don't touch the brake, the camera will pick it up and it'll start to apply the brakes as well, even if the cruise control is off. I really like those intelligence um, brake regens. I think they're really clever and they're really like the way, the easy to use because you know if you get that little momentary lapse of concentration, um, then obviously it kind of kind of comes into effect. But also as well, maybe if you maybe in slightly unfamiliar territory, um, or actually you've just come off the motorway and you've had the regen off, or you don't need the regen, it will pick that up. I've used it on the BMWs um, sometimes when I've been going up and down to Scotland, and um, and I must admit, you know, with intelligent recuperation, it's very good because I say it feels cars going in front of you, so I like that. That's good. Uh, the steering, well, I say the steering. I'm still in sport mode. It, it's all right, you know. There's a a tiny little bit of deadness in the dead ahead and you do feel the sort of the electronic assistance a tiny little bit as well you see there we go it says I'm going over 60 kilometers an hour well I am because I'm in a a 40 limit anyway there we go um, but as I say it, it's it, it is a good car it is typical Mercedes-Benz, you're not, I keep coming back to this, you're not going to be shocked by this car at all. There's nothing here that's going to really surprise you and you go, wow, I wasn't expecting that. It's everything you expect. If you've, you know, been driving current Mercedes-Benz product and you move into electric for the first time, then again, everything will be familiar to you. The operating system, the MBUX operating system, I think, is one of the best out there. Um, and it's voice activated as well. So despite the sort of lack of physical controls that you get um, some of the, in some areas of the cabin, the way that you can interact with the car is really very good. Um, and again, it's, you know, as I say, one of the best I've used. Certainly with somebody with a strong accent like me, if it can recognize my accent, then people who can talk proper English won't have a problem with this car. So that's good. So it is a relatively easy car to sort of live with. But I'm just, I'm just coming back to the whole, was this the right car for Mercedes-Benz to give us? I'm not sure about that. That's the one thing, because they say it's a big old Herbert of a car. And whilst it is very, very nice and very, very comfortable, there's an element of me that feels that despite the price level, this AMG line Premium Plus at £129,000 doesn't feel special enough. You know, you look at the likes of the Genesis, the GV70, I know it's a different type of car, I know it's a different um, uh, trim, sort of like size of car and all the rest of it, but if you look at the likes of the Genesis, um, the GV70 electrified, whilst I said that was expensive, 80, 000, nearly £80,000, it felt more luxurious than this, and this is £129,000. I'm just, yeah. Whilst the EQEs and the EQSs kind of did impress over a bit of time, I'm not immediately blown away by this car. 
And this is coming from someone who drives an SUV. All right, so how much is all this gonna cost you? What's the folding you're gonna need to get yourself into an EQS SUV? Well, the range starts with this car here, which is the 450 in AMG line premium plus trim level and that kicks the range off at just over £129,000 and it goes all the way up to the EQS SUV 580 business edition at just over £153,000. These prices are correct at time of filming so as I say this is not an inexpensive motor car and it is going to get more expensive because Mercedes-Benz have just recently shown the EQS SUV, SUV Maybach edition. So their ultra luxury trim level, the Maybach, and that's probably going to be in excess of £250,000 and take on the likes of the Rolls-Royce Cullinans and of course the Bentley Bentayga SUVs. So as I say, you're going to need to be searching down the back of your sofa if you want to get yourself into one of these. And what else could you be considering at this price point? Well, at the moment, there are a few high-cost electric SUVs around. As you know, of course, BMW's iX M60 is not a cheap car, and Audi's new Q8 e-tron um, in its S, S guys, again, is going to be a six-figure car. And whilst it maybe isn't as big, or neither of the cars are as big as the EQS, and they certainly don't offer the seven seats, you might be in that sort of price bracket where you would consider them. Until you get more of these EVs in this kind of ultra kind of luxury SUV market, then you may also be considering, of course, normal combustion engine SUVs in the luxury realms, which is going to include Range Rover. And of course, we know this year that Range Rover are going to offer an electric version of it. Bentley Bentayga, well, as I say, that's probably going to be where the Maybach edition comes in. And of course, Rolls-Royce Cullinan, it's going to take on those cars. And of course, you can't forget that Maserati are about to bring out the Folgori um, version of some of their SUVs as well. They're all electric, um, sort of like model brand, if you like, that they're getting into. And then later this year, we're going to see an old friend back. Of course, there's the revised Tesla um, model, um, model X, that's going to be back on sale, hopefully in the UK very soon. And I'm sure it's going to give this a real run for its money, because remember, that one is also offered with seven seat option. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV. We like its spacious interior. It's smooth and refined to drive. It offers a decent range. It's comfortable. And of course, the Mercedes-Benz UX operating system, we feel, is one of the best out there. We don't like. Well, it feels its weight when pushed. The styling is a bit bland, it's very expensive, and the entry-level trim doesn't feel luxurious enough for the price Mercedes-Benz are asking for it. So, what are we to make of the Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV? Well, it's relatively nice to drive, but then you'd want that, wouldn't you, given the price point the car's at? And we know how good Mercedes-Benz electric products have been because we've always come away very impressed with the standard EQE and the EQS, not to mention the combustion engine cars that they've, they've electrified, so the EQA, the EQB and the EQV. So yes, in that sense, it does what it's meant to do. My only gripe is this. Does the world really need another near three tonne, massive, six-figure price tagged SUV? And that's the one thing that I've come away from today feeling. Whilst the car does impress, it doesn't blow me away. It's kind of like they've just given us a car because they're expecting that's what people want. And therein is the little bit of the downside. Mercedes-Benz are only doing what we are buying at the moment, which seems to be big, heavy SUVs. And I'm not sure that they shouldn't have been a little bit more brave. And a company with engineering might of Mercedes-Benz, should they not be giving us something a little bit more daring? Should they not maybe have now come along with sort of like say, maybe more of a kind of lightweight kind of family, sort of like, you know, sort of like C-class size of car that has the kind of luxury trappings and the engineering quality you expect of a Mercedes-Benz, but using their engineering might and know-how to make something that's a little bit more 
well, lightweight and a bit more efficient. They should be taking on Tesla, in my opinion, trying to get sort of like those kind of run-of-the-mill cars that people are buying, such as, say, C-Class style cars, you know, or, or, or even sort of like newer versions of like the little A-Class hatchback, electrifying that. Did we really need this car? Well, the only reason they've given it is because we keep buying them. Thank you once again for watching yet another edition of Auto EV. As always, please make sure that you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. And when you've done that, press the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified of when our next video goes live. If you've enjoyed the video, make sure you do give it a thumbs up. And as I say, make sure you leave us your thoughts and comments section down below. Do you agree with me? Do we really need another big, heavy SUV? Or as I say, are you just saying that, well, Mercedes are only doing what everybody else is and who can blame them? As always, let me know your thoughts down below. Now remember, we're across all social media platforms as well. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and even TikTok now. So please go and give us a follow there too. And if you're just dying to see even more road test reviews of all the latest new electric cars to hit the UK market, then make sure you stick on our YouTube channel because there is an absolute plethora of videos there just waiting for your viewing pleasure. Not just road test reviews, but used cars, um, electric icons, motorbike reviews and even van reviews as well so make sure you give those a watch too all that remains for me to say is thank you once again for watching and continuing to support auto ev and i'll see you again soon